Since the 24th of February, the Ukrainian people have demonstrated an immense will to defend their country. But in a modern conventional war against an opponent as strong as Russia, will alone was never going to be enough. Ukraine was going to need weapons. And having been convinced to give up many of its more powerful weapons, including all of its nukes, in 1994 in exchange for security guarantees from the Russian Federation, United Kingdom and United States, the weapons required to fight off the Russian invasion were going to have to come from abroad. The rushed Western effort to rearm Ukraine had humble beginnings, and initially consisted mostly of shoulder-fired missiles, ATGMs and manpads. From there, aid would begin to expand in a process that was often marked by public debate. Ordinary people who may never have seen an armoured vehicle in their life suddenly became experts in main battle tanks, self-propelled guns, artillery pieces and long-range missiles as countries debated what logistical challenges could be overcome and what systems were worth sending. It's also a process that's been dogged by open fear and doubts. But for the most part, those voices have been ignored or bypassed. Military aid flowed into Ukraine throughout 2022, where it made a real difference be it the role of HIMARS in choking early Russian offensives, or the role that supplied armour and artillery had in the Kharkiv and Kherson offensives. And after months of internal debate and external pressure, nations in the West made a number of major decisions over the winter. Weapon systems long off the agenda, like advanced anti-aircraft systems, main battle tanks or long-range munitions, were now back under discussion. Never as quickly and never in the quantities that Ukraine had asked for, but slowly steadily efforts were accelerated. So in unpacking this incredibly important topic, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to give a brief bit of history on the whole idea of supplying a nation during a war without getting directly involved, and also talk about aid to Ukraine before the February 2022 invasion. Because there are some myths around that that I think could use with some quick correction. Then I'm going to look at aid since February, how that aid has evolved and changed over time, highlight some of the issues with how countries cost that aid, because there are some myths there as well. And then I'm going to look at some nations of interest, those that have been particularly proactive in assisting Ukraine. I'm going to look at Germany and the United States. Then I'm going to give an assessment of the impact and scale of the aid so far and ask the question, can it be enough? Does the West have the resources to support Ukraine sufficiently that it can push the Russians back from its territory? And if so, what would Ukraine need in order to accomplish that task? I'll also give a little bit of discussion around the barriers to increasing aid and also the idea of escalation risk. And so with a pretty full agenda, let's jump into it. The first thing to say is there's nothing new about the idea of resupplying a nation whilst fighting a war without entering that war directly yourself. Politicians and societies have regularly been more willing to risk treasure and equipment as opposed to committing their own troops. During the American Revolution, for example, for a long time before France committed troops and fleets directly, it was supplying the American colonists. But this idea of influencing a conflict without directly entering it really took off with the invention of the nuclear weapon. With wars directly between nuclear powers now a potential world-ending event, countries like the United States and the Soviet Union became particularly adept at fighting each other without actually fighting each other. Anyone who considers Western aid for Ukraine to be unprecedented or shocking really should turn their eyes back to the Korean War. Now, in Korea, the Soviet Union obviously wasn't involved in direct hostilities against the United Nations forces, which is why several Soviet pilots reportedly became aces and won medals for their combat accolades during that conflict. MiG-15s based in Manchuria would fly across the Korean border, engage UN aircraft, and then return home, assuming they couldn't be followed or attacked in Manchurian territory. To give a modern comparison, that would be like the United States taking a number of F-22 Raptors, painting them blue and yellow, putting American pilots in them, flying them from Poland into Ukraine, having those pilots shoot down a bunch of Russian aircraft while talking in really, really bad Ukrainian over the radio, flying those aircraft back into Poland and then saying the Ukrainians did it. But in the interest of avoiding nuclear war, the Americans basically went along with it just as they did in Vietnam when Hanoi suddenly turned out to have one of the most complex air defence systems in the entire world, which was quite the achievement for a country with limited heavy industry and no rocketry program. The Soviets, meanwhile, would discover that this cuts both ways in Afghanistan, when the Mujahideen suddenly started shooting down helicopters and aircraft with state-of-the-art Stinger missiles. Who could have given them those, I wonder? My point is that from a historical perspective, there's nothing new or unprecedented about the current situation. Nor is the phenomenon even new in Ukraine, as from 2014, Russia began pouring weapons in to support its proxies in the Donbass. 
while the West began providing some tentative assistance to the Ukrainian military. And to say the Ukrainian army of 2014 needed the help would be an understatement. Just like in Russia, the 1990s gutted the Ukrainian army. But unlike Russia, there wasn't enough money for a massive investment surge in the 2000s. Nor were many powers in the country at all interested in building a stronger and more professional force. Instead, the force continued to be basically completely hollowed out by underinvestment, poor leadership and endemic corruption. When Russia moved into Crimea, some Ukrainian officers willingly changed sides, while other units proved unable or unwilling to resist Russian movements. I've often been asked if there's a scenario where Russia could successfully have invaded Ukraine, and I don't like to speculate with regards to 2022. But in 2014, the situation was different. One wonders what would have happened if Yanukovych had remained in Ukraine, requested Russian troops to help stabilise the situation, and the Russian army had moved in in force in response. We'll never know, but it's possible Ukraine may have folded then and there. Instead, the country began a long, painful process of military modernisation, with the army needing to be thoroughly rebuilt almost from the ground up. To help with that process, Western aid was requested, and some was given. Now, it's important to keep this aid in perspective. You'll often see Russian sources claiming the reason Russia struggled so much in its invasion, or indeed the reason it had to invade Ukraine in the first place, is because Ukraine's force was NATO-trained, equipped with the latest and greatest in NATO weapons, and that this force was being built up to, you guessed it, invade Russia. It's funny how Russia always manages to make the West sound like some sort of supervillain. The reality was much, much more restrained. For much of the period 2014 to 2022, NATO assistance to Ukraine was primarily based on training capacity building. Perhaps 10,000 Ukrainians a year went through this sort of training, which was a narrow, narrow minority of the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who went through the army and fought in the Donbass during this period. Regarding weapon supplies, well, the situation is even more constrained. For years, America didn't even want to supply lethal weapons to Ukraine. And when supplies did start, it was relatively light equipment in relatively small quantities. Ukraine wasn't receiving tanks, APCs, jets and artillery pieces. It was receiving night vision goggles, some counter-artillery radars, some patrol boats, medical equipment and some javelin missiles. Not exactly the kind of kit you need if your plan is to invade a nuclear power. Funding through foreign military financing and the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, so USAI, which you'll hear a lot more of throughout the rest of this presentation, was also relatively restrained. I've seen it argued in the comments that Ukraine's pre-war defence budget only being about six billion US dollars didn't matter because billions of dollars were flowing in from the West. Which is, you might guess, a mild overstatement. In fiscal year 2021, the US provided, through both FMF and USAI, a grand total of 380 million US dollars. Now, don't get me wrong, for individuals, 380 million dollars is a massively life changing amount of money. With that sort of cash, you might even be able to buy a house in Auckland or Sydney. But when your goal is to rebuild a military from the ground up, it doesn't go particularly far. So contrary to the popular argument, I'd suggest the Ukrainian force of February 2022 wasn't some NATO army. It was a Ukrainian army desperately trying to modernise itself with some assistance from the West. And the type of aid it was receiving also puts pay to the suggestion that no one actually believed that Russia would be able to successfully invade Ukraine, which is another claim I see relatively often. The reality, of course, is yes, yes they did, both in East and West. Much of the last-minute assistance to Ukraine before the invasion is reported to have focused on insurgency tactics. The assumption was that Russia would overrun a majority of Ukrainian territory and that Ukraine would eventually win through driving the Russians mad with a sustained insurgency. And if you think someone is going to have to act as an insurgent, you don't supply them with heavy artillery and tanks. It's kind of hard to handle the logistics and sustainment on an Abrams when you're hiding out in the middle of a forest. And you can't exactly park the thing in a civilian garage and just blend in. But the Ukrainians had taken some of the cultural transformation on board and were resolved to defend their country. And when the invasion came in February, they worked with what they had. Soviet tanks, Soviet artillery, Soviet air defences. Now, if there had been no Russian invasion in February 2022, it's possible that Western aid would have continued more or less as it had. But Russia's decision to pivot to a full-scale invasion changed things. 
suddenly there was a major conventional war in Europe. And once the Ukrainians proved capable of making a fight of it in the first few days, old objections and doubts began to drop away and the Western weapons began to flow. We've talked about the first few months of the resupply effort before. Through February and March, the absolute priority was given to introducing as many simple weapons to Ukraine as possible, things that would help them stop the tank thrusts and counter Russian helicopters. For this, ATGMs and man pads were perfect. You could train a person on them in a couple of days. You could ship them by the hundreds using aircraft rather than slow moving ships. And thousands could be drawn down from existing stocks. If it could be fired from the shoulder, it went. And so if you look back to the footage from March, it's not unusual to see Pavel and his mates going out into the forest with six different sorts of anti-tank weapons and nothing but a coloured band on their civilian clothing as identification. Meanwhile, Kyiv's artillery and armour were all essentially Soviet or post-Soviet systems. When Ukrainian artillery smashed the Russian offensive towards Kyiv, that was using Soviet guns and Soviet-era ammunition. The problem, of course, was that the ammunition for those systems wasn't going to last forever, and so a call went out for resupply. The supply of heavy weapons really only kicked off properly in April. And even then, it basically followed two entirely separate streams. The heaviest equipment, the tanks, the self-propelled guns, and the infantry fighting vehicles, those were coming from places like Poland and the Czech Republic. These were all Warsaw Pact-era systems, T-72, Akatsia, BMP-1s, things that Ukraine already had the logistics and the training to support. The US and some of its allies, meanwhile, lacking a large supply of Soviet-era equipment, looked for NATO standard kit that could be introduced with less training and less logistics compared to its most advanced systems. Initially, they settled on things like the M777 towed howitzer. Perhaps the most impactful system to be introduced during this stage was the American HIMARS rocket artillery system. That gave Ukraine the range and precision to reach out and touch Russian ammunition depots, and we all know how that story ended. But many Western systems were still off limits, including their most advanced anti-aircraft systems and Western-made battle tanks. But just as Russian actions have helped encourage new nations to apply for NATO membership, they've also encouraged further weapons deliveries in Ukraine. Russia's switch towards mass attack on civilian energy infrastructure in October onwards was enough to break the political logjam in the West. For a long time, Patriot was too technically complex, too difficult to train on, too difficult to logistically support, and too escalatory to provide to Ukraine. But against the backdrop of the Russian military campaign and a threat from potential Iranian-supplied ballistic missiles, suddenly, as many times before, the impossible became possible. The focus of the most recent aid packages has moved from air defence to supporting Ukraine's ability to launch mechanised counter-offensives and offensives. That has meant supplying it with Western-made equipment to form new maneuver brigades capable of counter-attacking Russians or launching their own counter-offensives during the spring. That meant Western-made battle tanks, Western infantry fighting vehicles, and more Western self-propelled guns. Never in the quantities or as quickly as the Ukrainians would like, but January did see a number of these systems announced. One does wonder if the history books will remember the Free the Leopard campaign, and how teachers in the future will explain to their students that people wore leopard print in order to lobby for the delivery of main battle tanks, or the threats, now already forgotten, that the supply of these vehicles would spark nuclear war. Apprehension over a potential Russian spring offensive also led to a surge in announcements of new support for Ukraine from its Western allies. One of the primary mechanisms used by the US to send weapons to Ukraine is the presidential drawdown. This represents the president authorising the transfer of weapons from existing US stockpiles to Ukraine. And as the graph on the right shows, in the month of January alone, more drawdowns to support Ukraine were announced than in any quarter of calendar year 2022. The increases in European aid were similarly dramatic, particularly when it comes to heavy weapons. Of all the self-propelled guns announced for shipments to Ukraine, about a third were announced in January alone along with all the Western MBTs and infantry fighting vehicles that have been pledged at time of recording. Now, of course, Ukraine would have much preferred if these systems had arrived in 2022, or if they had been announced in larger quantities. But on paper, at least, the trend is there. With the taboo against sending battle tanks and infantry fighting vehicles now broken, there are really only two major capabilities that Ukraine is asking for that it has not yet been supplied with, at least at time of recording. The first is replacement aircraft for Ukraine's battered air force. The other, of course, is long-range strike weapons. 
weapons that will enable them to threaten Russian logistics targets far behind the lines. Here, Ukraine's ask range from the relatively short-range ground-launched small-diameter bomb through to the longer-ranged ATACM system, all the way through to air-launched cruise missiles like Storm Shadow. Now, all of these systems have previously been requested by the Ukrainians and denied by their Western allies, which, based on past precedent, means that most will probably eventually arrive. So if that's the broad way in which aid has evolved, how much has actually gone? Because according to Russian state TV, the answer is both not enough to matter in any way, shape, or form, but also enough to merit the nuclear annihilation of Paris, Berlin, and Washington, D.C. Oh, and Scotland. I always forget Scotland. Now, on one hand, you'd think counting how much aid has gone to Ukraine would be relatively simple. There are organisations like the Kiel Institute for the World Economy that put together these nice graphs compiling all of the various aid announcements from countries around the world. And you'd think that makes it simple. You just look at the chart and you can see that between the 24th of January and the 20th of November 2022, the US supplied a little less than 50 billion euros worth of aid to Ukraine. But while that might give you satisfaction of thinking for a couple of seconds that you found a clear and unambiguous answer, you then might pause to think, wait a minute, haven't you heard figures of 100 billion for US aid to Ukraine before, or numbers that are far lower? What on earth is going on? Now, when I first started doing videos on the war in Ukraine, one of the bits of advice I got from a more established YouTuber was to always keep things interesting for the wider audience. And I'm going to prove how much I value that advice right now by talking about everyone's favourite topic, accounting treatments and definitions. Because unsurprisingly, when you talk about the figures for aid to Ukraine, not everything is as it seems. So for the six of you still listening, let's dig a little deeper. The first thing is that there is no one out there policing what a government can and cannot classify as aid for Ukraine. If you listen to the news, for example, you would have heard that in December the United States Congress passed a Supplemental Appropriations Act to support Ukraine to the tune of 45 billion US dollars. President Zelensky even sent out a tweet, I believe, thanking the US for 45 billion dollars in additional aid. But that 45 billion included some things that you might, if you were a cynic, suggest weren't direct aid to Ukraine. 12 billion was for weapons to replace those that the Americans had previously sent to Ukraine. Another 7 billion was for US military operations in European command. Then there's the question of how you cost financial aid. There are a lot of different ways to give financial aid. You can give someone grant money, you can give them a loan guarantee, wherein you promise to pay someone else if they default, or you can give them a loan. And according to a lot of the methodologies out there, all those things are counted the same way, which doesn't make particularly much sense. If a bank offers to give me a house, I'm going to respond to that very differently than if they come forward and say, hey, we will offer you a mortgage with which you can buy a house. And then even within that, there are differences between loan terms. When the European Union announced that it would give an 18 billion euro loan to Ukraine, I saw a lot of media suggesting the EU was trying to put Ukraine in a debt trap. Until you read the terms on the loan and realise that it has a 35-year maturity with all payments deferred until 2033 and the various member nations picking up a lot of the interest bill until then. Once you account for the time value of money and what 40 years of inflation will do to an initial sum, that starts to sound a lot more like a grant than, say, a two-year short-term loan. In other words, when you see totals for aid to Ukraine, be aware that the accountants might have been a little creative in terms of how they built out the numbers. Just like a boss deciding that the lease on their holiday home by the beach is in fact their business legitimately leasing additional office space, interesting decisions can be made. And then even if something should legitimately be included, there's the question of how much it should be valued at. Because when you're supplying particularly old or moribund equipment, supplying it can actually be a saving rather than a cost. I've got an article there from 2013 talking about a time when the US supplied more than 1,000 M113s to Iraq. These things had been stored at the Sierra Army Depot for close to 20 years, and the argument was the cost of storing and demilitarizing them was so high that supplying them to Iraq actually realized a saving to the US government of something like $31 million. Realistically, there is no way the US government ever would have sent those M113s into service again. And a similar argument can be made for a lot of the Iraq and Afghanistan surplus Humvees and MRAPs that have been sent to Ukraine. So saying that sending these vehicles costs the equivalent of the full purchase value of the vehicle, 
might be legitimate in an accounting sense, but it doesn't really tell the full story. Similarly, if a country provides foreign military purchase funding to Ukraine to buy weapon systems from their industry, the way countries like Germany or the United States have, well, that too isn't really a one-to-one -one cost. Because the money is flowing immediately back into that country's economy, some of it is being collected back in taxes on the company or the workers that are earning their wage there. I've often made the joke that you can't pay teachers or public servants in armoured personnel carriers, and the argument's glib, but it remains true. Sending surplus military equipment just isn't the same as handing over cash. And that is before you even get to the question of how things are priced for the purpose of announcing a dollar value. If you look into some government announcements, or if you dig into the methodology of the Kiel dataset, you'll see some pretty generous assumptions being made. Because what is often used is the replacement cost of a system. And I imagine many of you can already see the problem here. If I grab a 30-year-old M113 from storage and send it to Ukraine, the replacement cost is how much it would cost me to buy a brand new M113. But a brand new vehicle and a 30-year-old one aren't exactly the same thing. It'd be like if Rob the Bricky crashed his pickup truck on the way to a work site and decided to put in the insurance claim. So he looks up how much it would cost him to buy a brand new pickup truck and puts in a claim for that amount. After all, he had a pickup truck and now he needs a new one. Who cares if the previous one was a 30-year-old shitbox? Now, when Rob does it to get a new ute, it's insurance fraud. But when a government does it, it's a little more complicated. Digging into the data, it's perhaps most obvious when it comes to the pricing of artillery ammo. In the Kiel data set, a 155mm shell is generally priced at $3,800 US dollars per unit. That's enough in 2023 to buy you a pretty good quality 155mm brand new shell. But shells have a lifespan and most of what is being sent is not brand new and top of the line. So while I'll use dollar values from the various aggregators throughout this presentation, I just want to suggest that generally when you're talking about military aid, it's probably better to count how many tanks, how many artillery pieces, how many rounds, than it is to count how many dollars they're supposedly worth. And to that end, you can see some pledged figures for certain system categories on the right there. 2,200 infantry mobility vehicles, that's mostly Humvees, 1,450 APCs, 925 MRAPs, 550 approximate tanks, 400 infantry fighting vehicles, and roughly 800 artillery pieces of various types pledged since the war began. And even then, you have to be careful because within categories, not everything is created equally. A BMP-1 and a Bradley are both infantry fighting vehicles, but they're not equal. Now, later on in this presentation, I'll try and give some context to these numbers and give an idea of the impact that they've had. But for now, when it comes to military aid and heavy systems specifically, those are some numbers to work with. Because now I want to jump into the potentially politically fraught territory of looking at which nations have provided this aid. For my part, I thought I'd just look at some of the major contributors and what sets them apart. And the first group of countries I want to look at are those that I've termed the vanguards. This is a general heading I'd use to describe a number of European countries that have really been at the forefront of driving support for Ukraine. In this group, you'll find countries like Poland, the Baltic States, the United Kingdom, the Czech Republic, and you could also make an argument for some of the Nordic countries and the Netherlands. And I include countries in this list not because of the raw dollar values of their contributions, but because they make an impact in one of three key areas. The first is by being critical suppliers of certain system categories, particularly heavy weapons, and here the Czechs and the Poles really stand out. Now, different countries responded different ways to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Some encouraged negotiations, some started putting together humanitarian aid packages. Poland and the Czechs kind of responded by finding every tank they could and putting it on a train pointed east. In GDP terms, the Polish economy is smaller than that of many US states. But more than half of all tanks that have been pledged to Ukraine, and even more of those that have actually been delivered, have come from Poland. Many of the remainder have come from the Czech Republic, either donated by the government there or purchased from the Czechs by other buyers. Half of all infantry fighting vehicles that went to Ukraine in 2022 were probably Czech. Most of the air-to-air -air missiles were Polish. A lot of the MLRS systems were Czech or Polish. The list really does go on, and the dollar values don't do them justice. Because whereas Western systems have very high dollar values attached and may run up the prices, what Ukraine desperately needed was the sort of equipment these countries had. And when you look at some of the Ukrainian units that participated at Kharkiv or Kherson, 
Well, you see a lot of armoured vehicles that came from these countries. And even as Western tank supplies ramp up in 2023, I suspect the Poles are again going to be a significant contributor as more and more of the PT-91 fleet travels into Ukraine. Other countries are notable because they're willing to accept risk. That is, they're willing to draw down their own capabilities and risk their own security in order to supply Ukraine. Many countries have refused to supply equipment because they believe doing so would limit their own security. And if that is an argument for any country, it should be an argument for Estonia. It's very unlikely Russia is ever going to invade Spain or Britain. But Estonia is a small former Soviet state on the Russian border. The country has always considered itself at risk of a Russian invasion, and the recent invasion of Ukraine gives it all the more reason to worry, which is why it's remarkable that in January the country announced it was going to send literally all of its 155mm howitzers to Ukraine, which really just caps off a process which had seen Estonia donate something like half its military budget and 1% of its GDP in Ukrainian military aid. Another example might be Denmark coming up with an announcement that they're going to send all of their Caesar self-propelled guns to Ukraine even before all of them have arrived from France. These contributions aren't going to change the war by themselves. They're simply not large enough. But what they're intended to do is to signal to other countries what level of aid is acceptable. If Estonia on the Russian border is willing to divest itself of a lot of its artillery in order to fight in Ukraine, then surely countries further away should be willing to take more risks. When countries say they're holding back equipment because they need to meet their NATO readiness obligations, countries like Estonia ask essentially, readiness for what? Unless you feel the Swiss are suddenly going to invade, what are those weapons being prepared for if not to resist a Russian conventional invasion in Europe? The final reason to note some of the smaller contributors here is their role in pushing the boundaries of what is and isn't acceptable. Throughout the war, there have often been taboos or red lines drawn against supplying certain categories of equipment. Talking heads would go on TV and talk about how a particular type of equipment would be particularly escalatory, too dangerous to supply, and as a result, Western countries should hold back. Then a country would do it, Russia would not respond with a nuclear attack, and other countries would follow their lead. The UK is worth a call out here. They were the first country to break the taboo against supplying Western main battle tanks. They didn't have to send particularly many challenges, they just had to be the first country to do so. They were also one of the first voices to tease the idea of supplying air-launched cruise missiles, the Storm Shadow. The Dutch, meanwhile, get an inclusion for being one of the firmer voices in favour of sending Western fighter jets to Ukraine. I bundle these countries together because it's impossible to look at all of them in detail in a single video, but also because it's important to call out that just because a country isn't one of the superpowers and large providers of weapon systems, although the UK is definitely a generous contributor, they can make an outsized impact either by providing particular systems that are in high demand or by pushing through political boundaries. And then there's a country that can never be accused of being a minor provider of systems to Ukraine. It's time to talk about the United States. And here, Americans, please hear me out. Now, I want to be clear, the US is clearly the largest single donor to Ukraine and likely the most important. The US is particularly vital when it comes to the military dimension of aid. That's simply a natural result of the size of the US military industry and their defence stockpiles. The US is basically that neighbour with the basement full of AR-15s. When the zombie apocalypse happens, they don't just have enough to arm themselves, but the entire neighbourhood. And when it comes to particular systems categories, the US is the critical or sole supplier. The all-important Gimler's rockets for HIMARS, for example, overwhelmingly come from the United States. But I also acknowledge that aid to Ukraine is a politically contentious, though still bipartisan topic in the United States, so there's a lot of information warfare and campaigning around it. And so I just want to suggest that while it is clearly huge and far and away the greatest contribution, it's also often, I would argue, overstated. I've seen comments on my YouTube videos claiming figures as high as $300 billion for US aid to Ukraine, which would come as really surprising news to the Ukrainians because at that point they'd be massively outspending the Russians. Now, since the Ukrainians aren't actually receiving aircraft carriers and railgun-equipped battle tanks, usually there's just some double counting going on. For one, when Congress votes money for a Ukraine supplemental, Often media will report that the entire sum is going to Ukraine. We've already talked about the fact that that just isn't true. But then what will happen is after Congress has voted the money, the White House will periodically announce how that money is being spent. These are the packages of 
400 million, 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, with a list of weapons attached. Often people will assume that that is new spending in addition to what has been announced by Congress. In reality, it's the same money. Congress has authorised the spending, now the White House is announcing that it is being spent. When people add all those announcements together, they're double counting. Finally, there's the problem of costing individual contributions. We've talked about that problem before. A lot of what the United States sends is not shiny and new, it's stuff towards the end of its service life. It's javelins with a couple of years left on their use-by dates, it's ammunition from older stocks first, it's vehicles that have been in storage over a long period of time. So when external aggregators look at those announcements and estimate the cost based on replacement value, they're kind of overdoing it. I don't say any of this to attack the aid that the US has provided to Ukraine, just to encourage people to look at numbers a little critically when they're reported in the media. Now with the accounting caveats out of the way, let's talk about what the Americans have actually provided. Because here the appellation guns, lots of guns, is entirely appropriate. I'd argue the US has actually been one of the more cautious actors when it comes to supporting Ukraine, at least relative to its available resources. Often the US hasn't been the first country to announce a new category of system going to Ukraine. And compared to other countries, the US has a titanic array of capabilities that it has so far held back. A TACMS is by far the most famous and perhaps the most impactful potential example, but from fighter aircraft to cluster munitions, it's a very long list. Compared to Poland or the United Kingdom, the US is holding a lot of its potential punches. But such are its resources that when it does commit, it has a tremendous impact. You can see a partial list there put together by the Congressional Research Service, and there's a couple of highlights that stand out. The 38 HIMARS systems were game-changing. 8,500 javelins and 50,000 other anti-arm systems is nothing to sneeze at. And perhaps most significantly, 1.5 million artillery rounds and the vast majority of the supply of Gimler's rockets for the HIMARS systems. Unlike many European powers, America did have deep bunkers of artillery ammunition. And so while many other nations might provide artillery systems, it's often US ammunition that keeps them firing. And then there's a final point that can't be walked past, and that's the role of the United States in providing deterrence during this whole event. Uncle Sam is the heavy hitter of Team NATO. He may not live in Europe, but Russia and the Europeans alike are very aware of the fact he's only one short plane flight away. And whatever the Russian propaganda might say, recent experience leaves no doubt that in a conventional conflict, the Russians would be overmatched by American capabilities. And as a result, America plays a critical role in the conflict by simply existing and looking threatening. One of the reasons that the Poles, the Czechs, or the Baltic states can afford to safely send all of their military equipment to Ukraine without bowing to Russian nuclear intimidation is because they live under a US security guarantee. They live under the US nuclear umbrella. And so the United States gives a sense of confidence to the entire alliance. You won't find that listed on any aid package, but in geopolitical terms, it does make a difference. And then to round out our look at major contributors, and at the risk of starting a major fight in the comments section, let's talk about Germany. Because depending on who you ask, Germany is either one of Ukraine's most important allies, or an obstructionist barrier that just keeps getting in the way. Now, to try and be as fair as possible to the German situation, you cannot, in my view, divorce a discussion of German military aid to Ukraine without considering Germany's unique history and political situation. Just as the Soviet Union's World War II history and memory shapes Russian culture and behaviour, Germany's memory of World War II shapes its. The country is deeply pacifistic to the point where it's nervous about developing even its own military capabilities. And as a result, perhaps no nation has had to come further in its view on military aid to Ukraine than Germany has. Before the war began, Germany was against lethal aid in totality. For the United States, arming a friendly country that is fighting against the Russians is basically a national tradition. It's on the little bingo checklist that every administration needs to tick off. But for Germany, this is something very new, something very different, and something that is politically fraught. There are divisions on aid within the German coalition government, and there are divisions within Germany itself. So whereas a Polish government that didn't want to send weapons to Ukraine would probably have to pose guards to make sure that regular citizens didn't steal them and transport them there themselves, 
the German government needs to go through deliberations and careful public messaging. According to many of the public figures, Germany is the second largest contributor of assistance to Ukraine once its share of European Union aid to Ukraine is taken into account. The second largest contributor of aid to Ukraine after the United States is actually the European Union as a collective, and a lot of the contributions to that budget come from Germany. Now, of course, pricing that assistance is very difficult to validate, but given the sheer size of the German economy, that level of generosity puts them in roughly the middle of the pack, sitting around the same place as Finland and Norway at roughly 0.3% of GDP. Now, a lot of that aid is financial and humanitarian in nature. Germans seem very, very willing to pay in order to support the Ukrainian economy, to help repair Ukrainian infrastructure, to accommodate Ukrainian refugees, to ensure the humanitarian needs of the Ukrainian population are met. These things are not a challenge in Germany politically the same way military assistance is. And the country has likewise so far been willing to bear the costs of decoupling itself from Russian energy imports and spending huge sums in order to stabilise its economy during that transition. Military aid, by contrast, has always been more contentious. And when Germans retort that the total volume of military aid from the country to Ukraine is significant, they definitely have a point. Germany has provided a range of systems and is one of the major contributors by value. They haven't provided the raw number of tanks the Poles or the Czechs have, for example, but they have provided a range of valuable systems. Self-propelled guns, bridging systems, shoulder-fired ordnance. They've recently announced the Leopards, the Martyrs, the RCH-155s, which is another type of self-propelled gun, and they're going to be one of the donors of a Patriot battery to Ukraine. There will be a link in the description of a list maintained by the German government of all of the military aid the country has either sent or intends to send to Ukraine, and it's a significant list. Everything from fuel additives and heavy vehicles to winter clothing to reconnaissance drones. The main criticism of German military aid, therefore, isn't its total euro value. I'd argue instead it's the government's messaging and also its approach to authorising industry and other nations to transfer German origin equipment to Ukraine. Now, the two problems are distinct but related. The first problem is on speed and proactivity and its relationship with authorizations. Germany has had to have slow and deliberate deliberations around each new class of weapon system that it agrees to supply to Ukraine. Now, I am not a German, but I would observe that this seems to be related both to those political considerations we talked about earlier in terms of the nation's history, coalition politics, but also a genuine desire to not be in the forefront, to not be the first to escalate, to always act in coordination and collaboration with others. As Schultz said, we are never doing something just by ourselves, but together with others, especially the United States. The problem, however, is because Germany is one of Europe's major weapons producers and many countries have purchased German hardware and those countries cannot ship that equipment without German approval, then it's possible to end up in a situation where Germany would like other countries to lead, but those countries require German permission to lead, which Germany would classify as leading and therefore refuses. Nations have faced similar problems concerning weapons of Austrian or Swiss origin. One does wonder if this will become an ongoing threat to the German arms industry compared to competitors like the Republic of Korea that may not impose as stringent conditions on export licensing. I would also observe that German messaging was often confused. Throughout this crisis, German ministers have made statements that appear to contradict each other. One voice might say that Germany would not stand in the way of other countries if they chose to send leopards, while another would say the decision has not yet been made. The combination of terrible messaging and slow internal political debates has often meant Germany ends up looking like a laggard, a country that others argue has to be poked, prodded and dragged into making decisions to supply Ukraine with critical systems. And a sober look at the data suggests that Germany is an important contributor of financial, humanitarian and military assistance to Ukraine, and its aid as a percentage of GDP and in raw terms compares very favourably to the disclosed commitments of certain other European powers like Italy or France, who have not come in for anywhere near as much public criticism. On military aid, Germany is not a leader, it's a valued follower. It seeks consensus, and once consensus is found, it becomes itself a valuable contributor. 
Under ordinary circumstances, this may have been okay, but it's been greatly complicated by Germany's role as a major defence industrial centre. And what will be interesting in 2023 is whether German industry now having gotten the thumbs up will make more significant contributions of its own to the war in Ukraine. But moving beyond the question of individual contributors, the question becomes, are all of these collective efforts actually having an impact? Financially, the answer is clearly yes. The cost of the war to Ukraine is enormous, and by some estimates, half of Ukrainian GDP is currently directed towards the war effort. And yet, while times are tough, the Ukrainian economy and budget are largely holding together. GDP declined by less than expected in 2022, and some projections are for as much as 2% real recovery in 2023. Inflation is bad at 20%, but it's far worse elsewhere in the world. And financial aid announcements from the United States and European Union mean that Ukraine's projected government budget deficit for 2023, essentially the cost of running the war, has essentially already been accounted for. Whatever debates are had about the speed and adequacy of military resupply, on financial aid, the point is clear. Western financial aid has succeeded in stabilising the Ukrainian wartime economy. And while conditions are difficult, as long as the aid continues, Ukraine will have the economic ability to fight on. Similarly, it's important to not forget the impact of humanitarian aid and refugee costs. Billions of dollars of humanitarian aid flow into Ukraine, Poland and other countries in order to provide for those individuals who've been displaced by the war. It seems odd to gloss over the fact that literally millions of people, primarily women and children, who have been forced to flee their homes, have been fed and given shelter and welcomed into other countries. That shouldn't be glossed over. In some countries, it's estimated the cost of supporting all these refugees. I think in Poland, Kiel's estimate is as high as 1% of GDP. Now, obviously, many of those refugees then take up jobs and help grow the local economy, but it is still a significant effort and a major contribution. There was a time in the past where some of my family were refugees with nowhere to go, so it is rather heartwarming to see countries throw open their doors with such generosity. But wars are not won by humanitarian aid alone, and so it's now time to look at military aid by the numbers. And I'll give you the TLDR up front. So far, military aid to Ukraine has been enough to make a very significant impact, but not enough to meet the total need. The graph in front of you shows three figures for a number of systems categories, tanks, AFEs, IFEs, etc. In blue down the bottom, it shows the Oryx visually confirmed losses for the Ukrainian military in each category. So, for example, nearly 500 infantry fighting vehicles. The orange bar is the number that have been announced for resupply. Not necessarily delivered, but announced by Western countries for resupply. And in yellow, I've got the figures of uh, equipment captured from the Russian military, weighted. What do I mean by weighted? I've assumed that for every three tanks, for example, Ukraine captures, one can be made operational. Now, once you net out those figures, you get these bars here. This is the net impact of resupply and captures minus visually confirmed losses. And it shows that military aid in most categories has been enough to cover for visually confirmed losses. Ukraine has likely gained tanks overall, for example. It's likely gained a lot of APCs, MRAPs, and infantry mobility vehicles. And so inevitably, there will be someone in the comments asking, hey, Perun, if they've gained equipment in most categories, why are they still asking for more? And there's a few ways to answer that question. The first is pretty simple. I'm using visually confirmed losses, so actual losses are likely to be higher because not every loss is going to be documented with a photo or a video. The second is that even if Ukraine had enough to replace its pre-war losses, it doesn't have anywhere near enough to provide for an army that has massively increased in size since the start of the war. Since declaring general mobilization, the Ukrainian military has enlarged several times over. The territorial defense has absorbed hundreds of thousands of additional recruits and the army has been massively enlarged. And all those new recruits would be really happy if they could be supplied with some heavy equipment. It's going to be a lot easier for them to do their job if they have infantry fighting vehicles and artillery than if they have to make do with some RPGs and AKs. The Ukrainians have been very clear they want to create new brigades with Western standard equipment to enable offensive operations, which means if even if they still had their entire pre-war stock of equipment, which they clearly don't, they would need a lot more to enable those units to be properly equipped and stood up. And the final point is because in a war, 
you're always going to want more stuff. And the more equipment you have, the greater extent you can substitute firepower for manpower and end up with reduced casualties. To take a historical example, by 1944, I think we can all agree that the Allies were going to win the war. They massively overmatched by that point the Germans and the Japanese. And yet, what was the year in which all of the Allied powers reached record levels for their output of all sorts of war materiel? From artillery shells to aircraft, well, it was 1944. Because there is no kill like overkill, and there is no incentive to ever have a fair fight. And it's in that sense that these numbers start to become inadequate. It may have been given just enough tanks and infantry fighting vehicles to offset its losses, but nowhere near enough to create the kind of army it feels it needs in order to beat Russia quickly or efficiently. But there's a lot more to this picture than just a count of how many tanks or SPGs that Ukraine has been supplied with. Ukraine hasn't just been provided with weapons, it's been provided with a range of capabilities that no amount of old Soviet hardware ever would have given it. Sometimes you need a specific tool for a specific job. If I want to move cargo, I'd rather have one truck than four Lamborghinis. And so Ukraine has received a lot of specialist capabilities from the West. HIMARS gave it a precision weapon system it could use to target Russian logistics. HARM gave it a weapon against Russian air defences. Starlink gave it a method for keeping units connected to the internet even when critical infrastructure was under severe strain. And so if you want to assess the total impact of Western aid, you have to take all these into account as well. Adding four systems to the MLRS column may not seem like much, but the combination of four HIMARS systems, crews that didn't sleep, and Russia concentrating its ammunition depot in range of Gimler's rockets led to some of the most impressive fireworks displays in modern history. And I've talked before about the impact some of these invisible categories of aid can have. We've talked before about how difficult it is to train up personnel to do depot level or factory level maintenance on advanced systems, and also how difficult it is to set up large factory complexes and repair shops in Ukraine where they could be attacked at any moment by Russian missile systems. And so part of the answer has been to move the repair shops into Poland, the Czech Republic, or Lithuania and other countries, and do a lot of this repair work there. It also means Ukraine can start using a system without needing to spend nine months training its personnel on a full ability to maintain and repair the thing. When German supplied self-propelled guns started having issues, they could be sent to Lithuania for repairs and then back to Ukraine. The Ukrainians needed to understand how to drive it, make it shoot, and do basic field level repairs, but they didn't need to learn how to comprehensively rebuild one after it suffered significant battle damage. Even in Ukraine, this sort of approach can have a significant impact. There are plenty of reports of something breaking, and Ukrainian troops who may be actively in a war zone, essentially dialing tech support in the United States or Europe, and asking how to fix a problem with a particular system. One hopes those call centres have particularly good customer service, because I'd hate to hear hold music while I was under artillery fire. And then there's the effort to set up training support and training grounds for Ukrainians outside the territory of Ukraine itself. The United Kingdom was the first one to come up with a major initiative, and they've announced they want to train 20,000 Ukrainians in 2023. Given the size of the British military, that is a very major training effort, and it is assisted by other countries like Finland and Australia. The EU program, by contrast, aims to train 30,000 Ukrainians, while the American program, well, there's no one consolidated program. They're doing combined arms training in Germany, they're doing separate programs for particular systems. Totaling them all up gives a very rough estimate of about 10,000 people per year. Now, already that's a significant increase over the targets for 2022, but there's probably still significant room for further expansion. And the Ukrainian military would certainly benefit from being able to send new raw recruits overseas, say to the United States, in order to do critical training there and take those skills back to Ukraine. And then there's a category of assistance which is often bitterly complained about on some of the pro-Russian telegram channels I follow, and that's Western intelligence support to Ukraine. If you open a flight tracking website on any given day, you will see NATO AWACS aircraft and surveillance drones flying observation routes along the Ukrainian-Polish border or out over the Black Sea. What you won't see is American and Allied surveillance satellites passing overhead, taking detailed imagery and gathering detailed intelligence on Russian positions and maneuver. Now, surprisingly enough, no one has come out and said how much intelligence is shared with Ukraine and on what terms. 
but it's fair to assume those aircraft and drones aren't up there for scenic flights. The final problem with accurately counting aid is beyond intangibles, it relies on people telling you what they're sending. Unsurprisingly, given that there is a war on and secrecy has some value, some countries have chosen to be a little more coy as to what they're sending. Italy, France, Finland, other countries, many out there are pretty sparse on the details of what they send. Finland, for example, will often announce dollar values but with no clue as to what is actually in the package. The polls and the checks take the approach of announcing a lot of assistance, but clearly not all of it. The first we knew of Poland supplying S-125 surface-to-air missiles, for example, was when the things bloody appeared in Ukraine. Ask the polls how it got there, and I imagine the response would be a shrug and a wry smile. And so while there are plenty of reasons to think that the monetary value of aid is often overstated, there's also a lot of reasons to think that there's an awful lot of aid that's just left out or undercounted. And all of this has really been leading towards one or two final questions, with the first one being pretty simple. Can this aid be enough? Can it make a difference? Because to say there is no consensus here would be a stunning understatement. Stop me if you've heard this one before. But there are those out there that'll argue that Russia is inevitably going to win, so sending Ukraine weapon systems only prolongs the war. They clearly sit in the camp that the disparity between Ukraine and Russia is so great that victory is impossible. On the other end of the spectrum, there are advisors out there who legitimately believe that if too much aid is given to Ukraine too quickly, Russia might collapse under the pressure, leaving the world with chaos and the risk of loose nukes. Now, I don't claim to be able to predict how the war in Ukraine will end. There are too many unknowns, and that's not the business I'm in. But I can analyse the inputs and outputs. I can look at the critical decisions and I can do math. And if we're only concerned with the material, then I think the doomsayers have got it wrong. In making that determination, it's important to remember there are four key barriers to providing additional military assistance. The first is logistics. We've heard about this a lot, that a system is too complex, will take too long to train on, it's too heavy, it's too difficult to maintain. Those challenges are very, very real, but at the same time, they're usually time-bounded and often overblown. Time and time again, Ukrainians have proven more capable of absorbing training and new material than was expected. And they've also proven very creative in getting around some of the limitations identified. With enough time and enough focus, logistical difficulties can be overcome. The Abrams, for example, is a demanding beast. But Australia, Morocco and Egypt aren't exactly superpowers and manage to maintain the thing just fine. Now, I'm not saying Ukrainians will start repairing Abrams using a washing machine, a microwave and a broken down tractor. But this is a nation that has gone from operating primarily old Soviet kit to basically the entire extended European armoured park in the space of a year. And so on that basis, I think it would be wrong to assume that training and logistics are insurmountable barriers for the Ukrainian armed forces when it comes to absorbing new material. And importantly, those challenges become less as new systems mature in Ukrainian service. Learning how to maintain and operate Bradley's 0 through 100 is going to be very challenging. Doing the same for Bradley's 101 through 300 is going to be considerably less difficult. So if those are the logistics and training barriers, there's also the issue of countries' domestic requirements, their comfort levels. What are countries willing to give? That's ultimately a political question and one we will return to in a bit. But the final point is the one that gets the most airtime, the ever-present fear of escalation. Now, when talking about escalation and escalation risk, I want to freely admit I'm not the one in the decision-making chair. I'm not the person who has to make the call to supply particular equipment and take a risk on whether or not it'll escalate the situation. So this just represents my opinion from the sidelines. With that said, I feel the word escalation is massively overused in relation to the war in Ukraine so far. In particular, I want to stress that escalation and anger are not synonyms. Something that pisses Russia off is not the same as something that will encourage Russia to escalate. Escalating isn't an emotion, it's an action, it's a thing you do. And so when asking whether or not providing a given system or capability to Ukraine will cause escalation, I'd suggest asking two questions. The first is how. What could Russia do that it has not already proved willing to do and isn't already doing? How could it escalate? And secondly, why would it escalate in that way? What would it gain out of escalating and how it improve Russia's strategic position? 
To give a hypothetical example, let's say Bob the accountant meets a professional kickboxer at the bar and feels he has been insulted. He could escalate by punching him. Bob has the how, he has fists, he could throw a punch. But he fails at the why because if he throws a punch, he's going to get his head kicked off his shoulders. And so instead, he laughs it off and moves away. Most Russian escalation threats are missing the how or the why. If the answer is escalating with more conventional attacks on Ukraine, well, the why is clear, but Russia lacks the how. They're already leveraging their military systems as much as they can in a conventional sense. Maybe they mobilize even more troops, but they're already putting in a pretty maximal effort. If the how is escalating the war by directly attacking NATO countries in order to cut off the supply of arms to Ukraine, well, then Russia fails at the why because a sober assessment of the balance of powers suggests that Russia would get its shit kicked in by the NATO alliance as soon as someone smacked the Article 5 button. And I've already done an entire video on why Russian nuclear escalation is a bad idea for them. And so time and time again, Russia's response to increased Western military aid has been to do nothing because there are very limited options available to them in the first place. Instead, I would argue the most escalatory option is to give Russia the impression that if it keeps fighting, it can eventually win. If Russia believes Western resolve may fail, that deliveries may drop off or be insufficient, then it is encouraged to escalate to apply more conventional military force in the hope that that will eventually break Ukraine and achieve their war objectives. Whereas if the balance of forces suggests that by fighting on Russia is not going to obtain its objectives and instead is going to suffer losses for no real gain, well then it's going to be encouraged to come to the peace table. The argument that nuclear powers cannot lose wars because they will always escalate to the use of nuclear weapons is just a historical and logical falsehood. America, the Soviet Union, Russia, these are all countries that are nuclear powers that have lost wars. Russia lost the First Chechen War despite arguing that Chechnya was an integral part of the Russian state. And no one in Argentina legitimately thought the British would nuke them over the Falklands. And so while escalation is obviously something that politicians need to pay attention to and carefully manage, in terms of assessing the hypothetical potential of Western military aid, I'm going to assume it isn't a barrier to the West supplying what it has available. And when it comes to the numbers between the West and Russia, it isn't even close. This was even an admitted Russian talking point before the invasion in Ukraine. The Russian mission to NATO just outright said that when you look at NATO powers, even excluding the United States, looking only at Europe, they outnumber Russia in terms of tanks, artillery, aircraft, helicopters, ships, and military spending. And again, that's before the United States is taken into account. In Ukraine so far, military aid has made a significant difference. It has blunted Russian offensives time and time again and allowed Ukraine to launch counteroffensives. And it's done it while on average committing something like 0.2% of GDP in the countries involved. Russia's strategy appears to be based on the assumption that Western countries won't deploy the resources available to them, but the resources are there. Even when you look just at the United States, it's clear the West has advantages in both quality but also quantity when compared to the Russian opponent. If you apply the same multiplier as we talked before about when discussing Russia's tank reserves, that is, 40% of them just don't exist at all, and of those that do exist, maybe half can be brought back into service, you end up with a Russian infantry fighting vehicle reserve of about 450 functional BMP2s and 2,100 BMP1s. That does not compare favorably to north of 2,000 Bradleys that America, on paper, has in reserve. Meanwhile, in terms of artillery, Russia was already openly advertising in its media releases that it was pulling old D-20 and D-30 towed howitzers out of storage eight months ago. Three quarters of their artillery is towed, not self-propelled. Two thirds of that is 122 millimeter, not 152. And there's nothing that they have in reserve in terms of self-propelled guns that is anywhere close to the M109A6s that the US has in storage. It doesn't take much to show how ridiculous the situation could become. If the United States and European Union dedicated 1% of GDP to funding Ukraine, that would give Ukraine a military budget of $400 billion. Now, I could come up with all sorts of weird and wacky escalation options for the West that would practically set Reddit on fire. For example, did you know that the US has a system where essentially you can push pallets of cruise missiles at the back of a cargo plane with very little training, 
and those missiles will launch in flight and fly to their targets hundreds of kilometres away. A small number of cargo aircraft with the Rapid Dragon system could launch cruise missile attacks all throughout occupied Ukraine. Or if survivability is a problem, there's a range of Western fourth-generation fighters that would serve as ALCM launch platforms. Or you could just keep it simple by giving Ukraine every spare ATACMS rocket, Gimlers, Gimlers ER, GLSDB that industry can furnish in 2023 or 24. I'm not saying any of these things are likely to happen, but they illustrate the point. It is ludicrous to say Russia is guaranteed to win when with a relatively limited financial flex, the West has the financial and military resources to overmatch Russian capabilities. The question becomes not can the West help Ukraine defeat Russia and push them out of Ukrainian territory, but instead, is the West willing to do what it takes in order to do so? Now, answering that question is obviously a political matter, which is hard to predict. All I can do with the data in front of me is tell you this. Generally speaking, aid to Ukraine is trending upwards, not downwards. US drawdowns are happening at a record pace, and security assistance funding for fiscal year 23 is about twice what it was in fiscal year 2022. European aid has increased significantly, and there's the prospect of direct deliveries from major non-NATO allies. The other thing to note is that aid deliveries become easier over time. There's more time to train people to solve logistical issues. As Ukraine develops capacity to operate certain systems, it becomes easier to scale up the number that they're given. And all the while, political concerns about red lines fall away and industrial capacity to produce new systems comes online. Leaving political questions aside, delivering aid is going to become easier rather than harder over time. And so while aid so far has been insufficient to meet Ukrainian needs, it is trending in the right direction. Which leads into the final question. If aid is trending in the right direction, what is it that Ukraine needs in order to achieve effects on the battlefield? What might it need to counteract incoming, almost inevitable Russian offensives and to take back ground of its own? Well, the first thing to say is the Ukrainians have been pretty clear about what they need. They need ground-based air defences, and then they need heavy weapons to enable them to launch counteroffensive operations. The number they've given, just for a counteroffensive, not to win the war, is 300 to 500 modern tanks, 600 to 700 IFEs, and 500 howitzers, with all the necessary supply of ammunition and long-range weapons. The pledges since December do not cover those needs, although they are heading the right direction. And there are plenty of ways they could, hypothetically, be met. The systems do exist. The tanks would be some combination of Leopard 2 and PT-91, the IFV of choice would be the Bradley, and the howitzer of choice would be the M109. But that doesn't guarantee a Ukrainian victory. I've just done a video on why the Russian army is still a dangerous opponent with tremendous capabilities. And so if Ukraine is going to have a good chance of taking back territory, it needs counters to these advantages. Giving them 3,000 Humvees isn't going to help if Russian artillery still makes movement in soft-skinned vehicles essentially impossible. The first solution, and what currently seems to be the preferred one, is to enable Ukraine to overcome Russian advantages in fire, so artillery and long-range weapons, by giving Ukraine the ability to manoeuvre. Giving them tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, self-propelled guns, and combined arms training to enable them to manoeuvre, rather than slogging it out shell for shell with Russian forces. As one commentator put it, the plan is to teach the Ukrainians to fight like Americans. Now, as a strategy, this may work. It may be the Ukrainians can get behind Russian defensive positions and roll up a line, taking back large swaths of territory. It's also risky, because we've seen from Russian experience how many losses can be incurred during a failed mechanized offensive. So in the interest of a little thought experiment, I thought I'd ask the question, how else could this problem be approached? And in doing this, I want to acknowledge my own bias. When you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And if you ask an expert how to solve a problem, well then usually they're going to come up with a solution that derives from their area of expertise. Ask the marketing team how your company should lift sales and they're going to say, well, more marketing. If you ask the army how to solve a strategic problem, they're never going to come back and say that the answer is more investment in the US Air Force. So unsurprisingly, given my area of study is defense industry, defense economics, and the material aspect of war, then I'm going to come up with a solution built on leveraging industrial and financial advantages rather than better tactics or operational acumen. But all that said, let's get into the thought exercise. How would we resupply Ukraine? And the broad suggestion here is to listen to the Ukrainians and give them what they need to fight like Ukrainians. 
The Ukrainians have proven that they're competent in using artillery and fires combined with some mobility in order to achieve effects on the battlefield. They can manoeuvre, but that manoeuvre is usually enabled by inflicting significant attrition first. So the strategy becomes give them what they need to win that engagement, to beat Russia on its own terms and take away Russia's primary advantages. So the first thing is to give Ukraine long-range weapons and a lot of them. The primary defence for Russian ships launching missiles or for Russian logistics bases is distance. They're out of Ukrainian reach. And that also means Russia can concentrate its air defences at the front rather than spreading them out to protect rear area targets. We saw the impact of that recently were attacks by just a handful of modified 1960s Thrij drones on Russian air bases in Russia itself were enough to convince the Russians to start putting air defence systems on the roofs of buildings in Moscow. So at the risk of setting off every escalation alarm in the room, give Ukraine a bunch of long-range weapons. Give them both GLSDB and ATACMs to target logistics within Ukraine itself. As they come online, give them extended range Gimler's rockets, give them extreme range artillery shells, and give them air launch cruise missiles. Things like Storm Shadow, so Russia faces a threat deep into its rear areas. The next step is to try to equalise the imbalance in artillery fire. Russian and Ukrainian sources both agree that Russia's successes are generally very heavily enabled by superiority in artillery. But what the Russian artillery reserve has in numbers, it loses in modernity, precision and maximum range. So give the Ukrainians a few hundred more modern Western self-propelled guns with good internal fire control systems supported by counter-battery radars and solid intelligence. The best candidate there available in quantity is probably the M109. Then, because it's a thought exercise and politics aren't a factor, unlock the American storage of DPICM cluster munitions and begin issuing them to Ukrainian artillery units. That makes a large supply of additional ammunition available while also giving them a much more capable round against certain target types. You probably also want to get the cheap stuff right at the governmental level. Both Ukrainian and Russian units still depend on volunteer organisations to get them vital additional kit. Things like cheap quad rotor drones, thermal images, night vision goggles and Starlink terminals. Now that system is agile, responsive and to a degree it works, but it also means this is an area where millions of dollars, not billions of dollars from government could potentially make all the difference in the world. In a war where drones are used for almost everything, it can't hurt to have a better supply than the other guy. Then you roll out the heavy metal and you do it at quantity. I've done an entire video on infantry fighting vehicles explaining the sort of value that something like Bradley or Marta brings to the Ukrainians. So to that end, the only thing better than adding 100 Bradleys to the Ukrainian military would be adding several hundred more. The system is stored and available in quantity, so get the training and logistical pipeline organised and get shipments happening on the regular. The final thing to say is that just because a system will take months of training and logistical preparation to deploy, doesn't mean you shouldn't deploy it. In a sense, your pipeline of planned support is your negotiating tool. It's your signalling mechanism on whether the other side is likely to win or not. And so to that end, it pays to have options available in the future. You can start training the Ukrainians on systems even before you've made the political decision on whether or not to supply them. You could do things like pull 30 or 40,000 Ukrainian recruits over to the United States and say, I am going to spend eight or nine months turning these troops into a modern, capable NATO standard family of units. They are going to learn how to maintain the equipment, they are going to learn how to use it effectively, they are going to learn how to fight combined arms. And if the war ends before they are ready, great, fantastic. But if not in eight or nine months, you're going to have units that can make a real significant difference. The point of that thought exercise is not to predict the future. There's no indication that those sort of measures are on any politician's agenda at the moment. And half the State Department would probably have a collective aneurysm if you suggested sending Rapid Dragon and a bunch of cruise missiles to Ukraine. The point is to iterate again that the West has the superior financial and military resources. That means, in a sense, the West is in the driver's seat. It can choose how much escalation risk it is willing to absorb in order to secure a win. So far, even by dedicating relatively meagre resources, it's already succeeded in bogging down the Russian invasion for the better part of a year and giving the Ukrainians a couple of significant wins. The future then probably sits on a spectrum between three general points. The first is a world in which aid from the West slows down or halts. 
In that scenario, Russia is eventually able to win an attritional war and force Ukraine to make deep concessions. That, however, would require a considerable political adjustment in the West. Many of these countries are politically committed to helping Ukraine defend itself, and so backing down from that position and allowing it to lose might be politically painful. The second option is that aid continues broadly as it has. This means a Ukrainian army in 2023 which is somewhat better equipped than it was in 2022 as new and modern systems come online. But they're also facing a Russian army which is larger than it was before thanks to mobilization. The third option is that aid escalates and some of the gloves come off. More heavy equipment is provided, some of the red lines around particular systems drop away, and Ukraine is given a surge in material resources. In that scenario, Ukrainian military gains become considerably more likely. Not certain, of course, but certainly more likely. And in war, that's about as good as you get. In conclusion, the idea of sending military aid to a country while it is under attack is not new from a historical perspective. Aid to Ukraine before February 2022 was not particularly extensive in terms of dollar value, but it did have an impact on helping the Ukrainians modernise. By contrast, the aid since February 2022 has increased dramatically, and while it has been subject to barriers around escalation risk, logistics and domestic readiness, it has had a significant impact. Now, that aid is difficult to count and may in some cases be exaggerated, but it is clear that it is, at least for now, on an upwards trajectory. And that gives Western powers a lot of influence, I would argue, on how this war turns out. Aid has so far been insufficient to meet Ukrainian needs, but the West does have the capacity to meet those needs if it chooses to do so. Russian resources are finite and the future is contingent. If the West throws everything it can into supporting Ukraine, then from a material perspective, Russia's options are limited. But if the West loses interest, dials back support, or is simply too slow in getting deliveries through, then Russian successes through mass and attrition become far more probable. Only time will tell which way the pendulum swings. All right, channel update to close out, and I know that the timing on this one was a bit difficult to get right. It was a natural extension of the Russia's strength video from last week, but I do know it means this video is probably going to be obsolete in a couple of weeks as more announcements are made. In terms of wider channel updates, I have picked out tentatively some new sound gear which I'll be ordering this week. We'll see if it makes a difference when it arrives. I'm hoping it'll lead to at least an incremental improvement. I also wanted to confirm that the sponsorships from January have now mostly closed out, and as a result, a number of charitable donations should be going through before next week. There's been a lot going on over here, which means that I haven't really been able to put up any content on the gaming channel for the last week or so, but I'm hoping to change that in this coming week, while also remaining scheduled on this primary channel. I'm also hoping I might have more interviews and side projects to announce in the future, but watch this space. But above all, let me say thank you again for the support and engagement you all provide. Videos on Russian military strengths or accounting practices in Ukraine aid aren't exactly automatic crowd pleasers and it takes a very particular sort of audience to make videos on those topics practical. So you all have my genuine sincere thanks for your ongoing support. I'll see you all again next week.